Hey guys, Mark Farashi, ProTech Dog Training. Too, hopefully the, the wind is not too much that you can't hear me. I've got my mic on. Good. Meet Apollo. Apollo is a very fearful pit bull. Okay. And the reason I wanted to show you Apollo is because we have our little controversy going on with Robert Cabral and Zach, and they've decided on a, a format within their um, a vlog where one person puts out all their points and the second person kind of responds to that answer. And instead of just getting on to a podcast, this is what Zach requested. Instead of doing a podcast and having it live and having the discussion between two people, he wanted to do it in a vlog format because it gives him more protection. And you can edit the video and make sure he's saying exactly the right thing. I mean, it's, it's all well and good. And, and, Robert's taking advantage of that too. You can see his cuts. He's, but he's very professional and he's doing it the right way uh, that meets that format that Zach has requested of him, right? Which is the controversy as far as aversives, meaning corrections in training and purely positive or force free, as they call it, which is the other camp, right? We have two camps. We have the purely positive camp and we have the people that believe in aversives known as a balance trainer. That's more of me, right? Now, if you notice, Apollo has a pinch collar on. Now, I told you that Apollo is very fearful. He's a very afraid of anything. But why would I have a pinch collar on him when you think of a versus of correction for this dog? Okay. Now, the reason is because when he gets this little bean, fear bean, he will backpedal. He will try to get away from everything he can. And when you have a flat collar or a harness on the dog, you are matching what's called opposition reflex. And I think, um, Justin Rigney did a video on it the other day. I was doing a go home with a customer. I love the way he said it that that opposition reflex is almost reflective in the respect of um, just like you or I, if we went into the doctor and he went ahead and he took his little rubber mallet and hit you on the, on the knee with it, you don't have the ability to stop. You're going to react, right? That's what he's testing, your reflex. And it's something you can't, you can't stop, okay? Same thing. If you were to go fall on your face right now, you couldn't stop but to protect yourself and put your hands out, right? You couldn't stop. If I go to strike you, you cannot avoid blinking. It's a natural thing to protect yourself, okay? Opposition reflex is the same kind of a thing with a dog. And us, for that matter. All animals have a certain amount of opposition reflex, some more than others, right? So with that, when I was trying to go from the kennel and put him into my trailer every night and let him sleep inside in a crate with me, he would get freaked out. He didn't want to go up the stairs. It took me a lot. And now, when I go back over to the trailer now, he shies away. He wants to get away. He's he gets into the trailer fine once I get him up there and coax him, but he's still got that aversion and he right away wants to respond in a fearful way. Now I'm gonna show this to you. I'm gonna go ahead and put this collar on him. Remember, he's already fearful. I haven't done anything to the dog to make him this way. A lot of people would see a dog like this and they're gonna go, oh, poor dog, he's been abused. That a lot of times is wrong. It's incorrect. The dog hasn't been in abused. He's only been abused in the respect of missing critical development periods and having the skill to build the dog when they're in the right frame of mind. When you miss that, you end up having the dog be always at home. He becomes very secure and every dog's a little different in their genetics. This dog's genetics isn't that strong either, but the biggest thing is that he hasn't been offered all the things to build strength. He's been sheltered in a secluded area, his home, never been out in public, that kind of thing. And then the owners, a lot of times, will end up over coddling a dog like this. Oh, my little snug, oh, my little baby. And when you do that with a dog, you end up getting exactly what you're giving. You treat him like a little sissy, he's gonna become a sissy. It's just the way it is. So this dog is very fearful, but I have no, I no go on, Paul. Come on. think that it's because of the owners, right? The first couple of days, I couldn't even get him on this thing. It was like a hot plate. He wouldn't touch it. He was freaked out. He may not look that afraid now, but he definitely shows it. I've got him on the flat collar right now. Apollo. See it? Okay. Right away, he's going to shy away. And if I pull him and start trying to a pulling match, he's going to give me opposition reflex. And he's not responding because of me and our relationship, but I wanted to demo that to you to show you the fear that he's got in him. He's got a big, severe fear in him. So I'm going to go ahead and back that off right now. Good. Good. Okay. We call this backwashing or I call it backwashing. And I look at it like having a Anytime I, I face this kind of fear, or let's say the dog's been struck in the face, this dog hasn't, but he responds right away. But if he would be hand shy, I would start doing things like this, okay? And after a while, the dog's not going to be as hand shy because that hand means a different thing to him, 
right? And it's not because he's been struck, but again, I want to let you see this. So why would I put a pinch collar on a dog like this with this much fear? And all I'm going to be doing is a lot of hot dogs, a lot of trust building, a lot of building relationship between him and me. Why would I put the pinch collar on? Not because I want to have correction, but I just want to stop him from pulling back into that and freaking out and being able to have the ability to set his opposition reflex. He's got a pinch on it. It doesn't feel as good. Okay, so when he backs up, it's not comfortable. And he's going to stop leaning into that because it doesn't feel good, right? And that gives me the opportunity. Now, back to uh, the attitude of things that are aversive. I can be aversive and be abusive and overfeeding the dog or giving so much social pressure that I'm screaming and yelling at the dog and coming at him all the time. That's the same thing. It's just as much abuse. It's an aversive. And, and you're going to see that purely positive people do it all the time. They end up getting frustrated and get upset. They're human just like anybody else. And they will do that and say that that's okay because it's not using these terrible tools that you hear about all the time. Reality and truth. The tool is only as good as a person wearing it, excuse me, using it, okay? Only as good as the person using it. And you hear me talking about that all the time. I have the ability. I have the power. I can treat this just like I would with a horse. If I have a certain bit in the horse's mouth, you hear the term supple hands all the time around horse people. They're talking about how supple, how much feel does that person have within their hands to be able to feel what the bit is giving them and what the horse is giving them using that tool. Okay. Some bits are a lot more severe than other bits. It's all about the animal and the skill and the person that's using the tool to be able to do the job in the best way possible and not be abusive. What does that mean to me? Well, it means to me that if I put the pinch collar on the dog, I have the power. I can do just this with my fingers. I'm just doing a little bit. The dog feels that pressure. Believe me, I'm not pulling into it at all. I'm just putting a little pressure on it. I have the ability with feel, with suppleness within my hands and my ability to use this tool to use it very light or I can use it very heavy when I know what, I want, what I'm doing, right? The power is yours, right? It's not the tool that creates this. It's a person using the tool, right? That's why I am not adverse to using a tool like this or a stem collar because I'm very adept at being able to use it in the right way and do the lightest amount that I need depending on the situation with the dog and the dog itself, right? This dog, again, is very fearful. Yep. Everything it's doing now, I had to work very hard to place, place, come on, come on, there you go, yes, good. Very hard to get it to do because it was afraid of everything. Didn't want to touch this, didn't want to touch the table, afraid of everything around it. And it's still got a lot of fear. Fear is one of the hardest things to overcome, to overwhelm. That's why we, say, we talk about it so much, <coughs> excuse me, in regards to developing a puppy People, places, things. I want to get the dog so confident that it's what we call bomb proof. It doesn't care about what's going on around it at all. And I've got the dog into me and toys and hot dogs and all kinds of things. And I build the dog. I develop that animal so that it becomes a strong dog, right? When we don't do that, we don't get the dog out in public and get the dogs what they call socialized. I don't like that word. I call it environmental saturation because the word socialization and socialized has become so misnomered by the general public. They don't really understand what that word means and they use it in the wrong context. They think that that means the dog should be going out and making friends with everybody and they should be very social. Wrong. We want environmental saturation. We want the dog to be neutral to its environment and to be able to not be in, even affected by anything. I don't go to a dog park. I don't believe in them. I think they're like a Russian roulette. One precocious dog comes over there to my little puppy and pounces on him. He'll ruin the dog for life. Or if I have a dog like this with a fear problem, when I take that dog in there, right away we're going to have a fight because of defensiveness and insecurity and all these things that happen in a dog park that wouldn't happen if I don't go in there. So it's like Russian roulette. It happens once. You're going to affect the dog or ruin the dog for life, right? So that's one of the reasons I don't do that. So back to this tool. All I got to do is put a little pressure on it just like that. The dog gives to that pressure. Why? The dog is very soft, very insecure, very fearful. And again, back to what I was saying, fear is the hardest thing to overwhelm. All I can do is come at this dog with the least amount of aversives as possible and have a good attitude that I don't even put a heavy social pressure on the dog. Right. What you saw me doing a couple minutes ago was just enough to demo something. I wanted to show you that the dog was very fearful, but I'm aware of it. Right. Good dog. So we do the backwashing. If it's fearful of that attitude, I come in real strong on it. Good. You're all right. Good boy. Come on. That was a little too much. I've got to gauge it. So I'm going to bring it down a little bit. Good. Good. 
Good. See what I'm doing? I didn't go the full Monty on him, right? So I got to take it down below his threshold and keep building him on it to backwash that behavior and not have him think that I'm going to hurt him, right? Good. Good. There you go. Good boy. We got to build the dog. It takes a lot of work and this is really hard to teach a dog. He'll sit down, stay when he's in this mental state of mind. I've got to build the dog. It's going to take a lot longer. This would be an area that I would say that the purely positive, more positive approach would be a lot more beneficial to this dog than any type of aversive. We've got to get him out, start getting him acclimated to all this, right? Good boy. Good. There you go. First two or three days, the guy didn't want to take hot front dogs from me. He was so afraid, right? So fear is caused by a lot of the times not developing the dog properly, not building some moxie. See how I'm treating him? Good. I'm not foo-fooing him, right? Good boy. Good. After a while, he's going to figure out that that's not going to hurt him. Good boy. Apollo. Come on, place. Apollo, place. Come on, place. Yes. Good boy. Good. Good. Nope. Good. And all I did was a little bit of a no. Apollo, because I don't need any more, right? So that's what I'm trying to get across as far as aversives, okay? It's all about the dog. But I've got a full gambit in my in my toolbox. I can use all kinds of things. Nope. Good boy. Come on. Good boy. Good. Yeah, there you go. Little help. Voice tone, body language, coaxing him through. Good boy. Good. Good. That's my boy. Good. There you go. Good boy. Yay. All right, Mark Farashi, Pro Tech Dog Training, trying to get a point across in regards to aversives. The power is in your hands. It's not the tool. It's the person that's using the tool. I'll talk to you later.